think we're going to get started here in just a minute or so. So come on in. All right. I know it's uh, me standing between you folks and lunch here, a dangerous position. <laughs> but I think we'll have some fun anyways. So uh, welcome to the session, Running Away from Computation and Interaction. My name is Mike Shaw. I'll introduce myself in a moment. Uh, but we're going to have a little bit of fun here uh, and give you an introduction to how we think about computer science a little bit and specifically in terms of C++ when it comes to computation. So with that said, again, a little bit about me, your guide today. Uh, I'm a teaching faculty. You can read a little bit about my bio here later, but I enjoy computer graphics. Uh, my research is in performance, and I do a lot of C++ stuff. I teach in C++, I've worked in C++, um, and feel free to check out uh, my materials there. Uh, code will be available for this talk. I will show some code, um, and you're, feel free to download it as you like. Uh, and again, this will be captured in the recording later on. But you can Google my name in my GitHub and you'll find it. All right, so here's the abstract that led you here amongst the tracks. So again, great to see a full audience here. Happy to have you folks uh, with me. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of our goals for today from this uh, abstract, though. So what is this talk about? And with the title here, Running Away from Computation, uh, an Introduction, uh, well, are we going to do some running? Uh, maybe. <laughs> we'll see how you feel about the talk. Um, but, uh, you know, are we running computers faster? Okay, we're here for C++, so, you know, many of us are here for performance reasons. That's one of the reasons uh, C++ is a great language, as Bjarne talked about in his uh, keynote. Uh, but I want to talk exactly about what I mean from running away uh, and how we choose a direction to sort of run when it comes to computation. So uh, again, what we're going to learn about today is just a fundamental trade-off that we make in computer science. And we actually have a unique one in C++, I think, uh, whether we think about it or not uh, using this language. Um, so I hope that's intriguing enough to, again, keep you around here. Uh, Audience-wise, you know, I think uh, beginners will get a lot out of this, but uh, if you have a little bit of experience with C++, I think you'll also uh, get some insights or add to the discussion. Uh, so speaking of which, uh, I will show some performance numbers. <laughs> so as always, with any performance talk, you'll have to validate uh, with the code later. Uh, but I think there'll be um, interpretations that you agree with. Uh, so anyways, let's continue. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, part of my audience here, I have a little bit of participation. Uh, so the first question is, and feel free to shout this out in a moment, but what's the most fundamental trade-off in computer science, uh, in your opinion? What do you learn about? What kind of things? Uh, yeah. Memory and CPU. Memory and CPU. Yep. Uh, memory, CPU, speed. Other ones? Yep. Complexity and performance. Complexity and performance. Yeah, how are we manage our code bases, how we get speed, yeah. Abstraction and performance. Abstraction and performance. Maybe um, how extensible our code is or how we can maintain it. I guess that's my interpretation uh, versus our performance. Other ones, yeah. Oh, I heard one on data, data structures. Yeah, full of trade-offs. Another one? Uh, yeah. What, what was that one? Time and space. Yeah. Want to say another one? Yeah. Readability. Readability. All great ones here. Uh, and you'll see in the little corner, uh, I have the little, I'll advance the slide when I hear the answer I want. <laughs> but there are many, uh, and we have to pay for them. Uh, but I'm going to argue the most fundamental one, probably the one you learn whether you're self-taught or in university, is time versus space, right? where we can actually kind of use either as a currency. We can often trade a little bit of space or memory, and folks mention this in various forms, to try to buy us a little bit more time, or sometimes we can spend time to uh, give us a little bit more space or memory. And again, usually you learn about these things in terms of big O complexity, so maybe you've seen one of these charts here where we talk about algorithms being uh, linear or logarithmic in their complexity. And again, that's always you know, relative. We're using that as some measurement for the relative to the input of a size for some data structure. 
Okay. Of course, in practice, as I mentioned, we have to measure, uh, get some empirical results for these sorts of things. But it's a good guideline to guide us. Okay. Uh, so let me give you an example first where there's sort of a clear trade-off between time and space. So this is a tale of two singly linked lists here. I'll show you two implementations and guide you here. Uh, so this first implementation that I have, again, just a minimal implementation of a linked list, nothing fancy, no you know, C++ tricks here. Um, I'm going to have a head here to keep track of my node where the linked list starts. And the function I'm interested in is append here. Okay, so append will just take some integer, use that integer to create a new node, and traverse the list and append it at the very end. Okay, so there's a little loop here, and we traverse it as we add on each node with the append operation. Okay, so that's link list number one. Now, link list number two here, our second uh, implementation here, uh, this time we're going to take advantage of this fundamental trade-off that we have, time and space. I'm going to pay a little bit more storage, and I'm going to add a tail here, okay, in our link list. So some of you might know where this is going, but uh, a few extra bytes for that pointer here. And then we can make this observation that, well, for an append operation, it becomes a little bit more simpler. There's no uh, additional loop here. I'm simply just updating my tail of this linked list. Okay. So let me go ahead and proceed forward here. So looking at each uh, of the big O's of the linked list, uh, which do you expect to be faster? Link list uh, number one which again, I'm giving away the, the big O here where we've got a loop here, O of N, or linked list uh, number two. Um, I don't know how to do this appropriately. We could boo one of the linked lists <laughs> and say, you know, boo. Um, but uh, I think the audience, um, I see more eyes going over here that we're expecting O of one or a Constantine operation here to be faster. Now, of course, again, we always have to measure, 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 measure. Uh, but in this case, uh, I measured for you, and we can see what the results are. So again, from a big O standpoint, this is better, right? theoretically, what the complexity is. Um, and the actual measurement, well, link list number one that does an iteration takes about 14 and a half seconds here for 100,000 elements. Uh, so again, we're appending, traversing the linked list, appending to the end, appending, you know, uh, traversing the linked list every time. And for our second implementation, where we're just updating the tail, again, 0 0.01 seconds. So you can say, wow, you know, I could make this a YouTube video and say, you know, 1,457 times faster with this one, you know, neat trick. Because <laughs> <laughs> we know our data structures and this little trade off we made. So uh, with this improvement here, essentially what I've done is I've reduced the number of instructions that we have here. Uh, or at least that's one way to think about it, the number of operations that are occurring at runtime. Right? On the left-hand side with our linked list, every time we append, again, we've got to iterate through the entire uh, linked list and do this traversal before we're able to uh, append at the end versus, again, on the right side. Um, so simple enough philosophy, do less work, usually you'll yield better performance uh, and sometimes much, much, much better performance. So again, just a classic uh, example of a runtime optimization here, just choosing a better algorithm, uh, which somebody mentioned here. A better algorithm or a better data structure, which we'll get to. Uh, and these are some of the types of things that uh, some of us as performance engineers love doing, sort of fiddling around with the algorithms and you know, finding these little areas where we can get a lot of performance. I know I certainly do. That's why I'm here giving a talk on it. <laughs> um, so. You know, here's the recap. Uh, we made a significant performance improvement here at runtime by reducing the amount of time to complete some task using a better data structure, right? By amending our linked list number two operation. The cost for us here was just one additional pointer, eight bytes of storage on a 64-bit system. Uh, so it's just some constant amount of space per linked list number two uh, that we make use of. And again, the benefit is reducing our append to an O of 1 operation, or constant time, right? just however long it takes to update uh, our tail, uh, as well as the allocation of the node and so on. So this space trade-off appears very good to me. 
Um, and again, especially if we're certain that we're going to be appending to our linked lists often. This is a good trade-off to make. Again, you'll have to know what type of problem you're solving, but if we know we're appending frequently, probably a good uh, design decision here. All right. So this leads me, though, to another fundamental trade-off. Uh, it's sort of specific to C++, as well as other languages, but I'm here to talk about C++. Um, and that has to do with compiled languages here. So the other fundamental trade-off um, that we can make in C++ is compile time versus runtime, where we can spend a little bit of compile time to maybe do something and get an advantage at runtime, or vice versa. Maybe take a shortcut at runtime to increase our compile time. Okay, depends on what trade-off we need to make. So in C++, um, as well as other compiled languages, I know folks use other languages sometimes, <laughs> um, we can make, again, this trade-off for space versus time like we did just for our data structures. Uh, but we can also, again, make this compile time versus runtime trade-off. And again, this is something when I'm speaking to my students about uh, the first time they start programming, it's a little bit confusing that you have to think about what's happening when you're compiling your code and runtime. Again, especially if you're coming as a beginner from an uh, interpreted language, for instance, where you just hit run and the code goes. Uh, in a way, we also pay for this in different ways. Maybe there's a little bit more cognitive overhead where we have to think about things uh, folks mentioned as one of the costs here, developer time, for instance, when you have to think about compile time and what we want to optimize for. Uh, and there's toolings and IDEs and stuff that can help us um, reduce some of the cognitive load or compile times and so on. Uh, but it's still something that we have to think about um, in C++, but it's something we can take advantage of. Again, it's another place where we can make a trade-off. So just briefly looking at the compilation process, so just a real quick look. Again, I think it's fair to classify C++ as a compiled language. There are interpreters that exist for it, but generally we're compiling our source code. And the goal is uh, to sort of walk through this process of taking C++ source code, transforming it to assembly, and then ultimately some object code uh, that we execute on the machine. So again, here's the high level process, which again, I think this audience will be familiar with. Um, but again, the observation is just as we're walking through each of these steps, taking a source code here, uh, and sorry, my diagram says hello.c, <laughs> hello.cpp, um, but it does go through the preprocessor, and there must be some computation going on in that step that's interesting. Um, so there's some computation there. And then we get to the compiler ultimately, and that's transforming or doing some sort of operations to get us eventually to our assembly code. And then our assembler you know, ultimately has to do some other transformations as well. So there is computation going on there, so can we take advantage of it? And that's often what we're thinking about when we're thinking about compile time uh, operations here. So again, uh, compile time means we're thinking about what operations and computations happen before we execute our program. So sort of at the source code level, before we press uh, compile on are actually running and executable. And runtime means we're concerned with the actual execution of the program. So how fast is our linked list running? Uh, the overall you know, execution time of that program that I did before. So let's learn a little bit about some of these runtime operations, uh, optimizations that we can make and see if we can also apply them to compile time. Because again, I'm going to start with the runtime stuff because that's what I've always liked fiddling around with. Uh, but again, we can make this trade-off and pay <coughs> Uh, runtime for compile time and vice versa. So running away from computation at runtime, how do we do this? How do we make our programs run faster? And again, this is part of the fun part if you're a performance engineer or thinking about getting interested in this type of stuff, performance in C++, again, a great domain for using C++. Um, but you can kind of look at any performance problem just with the scientific method. Right? You ask a question, why is my code slow? <laughs> why isn't it running as fast? Or why, how fast could this code run? Some question, you know, do a little bit of research, you know, watch some CPP, uh, core CPP talks, uh, read some C++ books, etc. You can construct a hypothesis and say, I think it's slow because of X, Y, Z. Right? For those of you who are just in Avicii's talk, you can talk about interleaving, data dependencies, all these different things. So you come up with some hypothesis. 
Uh, and then you test your hypothesis, of course, with an experiment, and we measure. Maybe it's just a time tool, profile, and so on. Analyze our data and say, yes, this is faster, or this slower, and why. And then you hopefully communicate your results. Say, my program's you know, 145,000, whatever <laughs> percent faster, uh, and you get a promotion. <laughs> so uh, let me provide a few examples here, and let's just see if we can find some themes with this idea uh, with runtime optimizations. So number one uh, kind of comes as no surprise, but again, we could use a better algorithm. And again, better algorithm for your use case. So as we saw at the linked list example, if I know I need some expanding data structure, I'm going to append to it. I can just kind of grow it. Um, then we can make some trade-off here and improve our append algorithm okay, by paying a little bit of storage, just like we did. Okay, so we've already seen this uh, trade-off of space versus time. Uh, so that's a great starting point, again, for just reducing the amount of what I call here the recomputation that you have to perform. So again, with this step here where we were iterating over and over and over again, um, you know, again, this was uh, quite slow. Now, could anybody think about in this linked list operation one here, could I have also applied this strategy without maybe modifying my class? Um, could I have added something else in this algorithm uh, to maybe keep track of you know, where we last depended to? What was that? A little bit louder? Yeah, just prepend, right? I could change the problem. Again, if I'm just growing this, uh, then I don't uh, need to actually add the extra pointer, so that could fix it. I could have actually, or I could have put some storage maybe in here, some sort of um, node to keep track of our last inserted place, um, you know, if this is going to be a, a modified list. So again, just depends on the problem how we uh, can modify this. But again, I chose a pen, so that was the solution. All right, so you know, choosing a better algorithm uh, or improving our algorithm, trading space for time works. Uh, the second thing we could do is just do less work. Again, less computation, again, uh, as the theme is, probably gets us better performance. So in this case that I'm gonna talk about, sometimes we don't have to make that space versus time uh, trade-off uh, in, in a sense that we just have to sort of think about ordering. And you know, when I thought about this, this was from like, I think I read this oh, probably a, a decade at least ago from like Sam's Teach Yourself C++. <laughs> and it teaches you about short circuit evaluation, right? So in this example here at line 20, you can see I have uh, two ampersands and at line 25, I have a single ampersand. So with the short circuit evaluation, if one operation is uh, false, no need to proceed and evaluate the other operations, okay? so. Uh, this Boolean versus maybe this really expensive function that's going to return true or false. Okay, so I can kind of reorder these um, around and get an early exit, right, if I have these in the appropriate order. Okay, so that sort of makes sense there. Um, and again, if I naively flip the operations and put the most expensive operation first, that could be costly. Okay, so again, it makes sense to probably do the cheap or the less thing first if I've got a series of uh, functions or flags that I need to evaluate in this conditional here. Um, so order of evaluation can sometimes matter. Okay, again, we just have to think about what problem we're trying to solve here, but uh, take advantage of our short, short circuit evaluation built into the language. Okay, so that's better here. Let me flip it around to the right way. Again, just doing the cheap Boolean check. So, what I'll call those uh, sort of runtime uh, optimizations that I've done here is I'm sort of at a fork in the road here. I can kind of make a left turn um, at this point and you know, we could start talking about some of these more little optimizations, some of these little tricks or hacks that you might have picked up over time, things like, oh yeah, short circuit evaluation. Of course we know about that. That's probably what we default to most of the time. Um, or we can sort of turn right and think about these more high level uh, abstractions that we're going to be using, choosing better data structures and better algorithms. Uh, we're going to look both directions, but let's take a left turn first uh, and, and see what optimizations we can find. So some of the little uh, things that we can do, just like with our short circuit evaluation, thinking about 
ordering is start hand tuning our code. Um, I've got a little spoiler alert. We're going to look at this at the compile time optimizations as well. Uh, but we can do things like look at our code and see if we find uh, code that's not executing, unreachable code. Uh, that's a dead code elimination optimization. Uh, we can fold certain expressions together to avoid recomputation. I'll show that. Uh, for those of you who are uh, at Aviche's talk, talk about unrolling loops here to maybe uh, help out with parallelism or caching. Uh, less um, conditional tests, so that's unrolling. Inlining functions, avoiding function call overhead, or importantly, enabling other optimizations when we put a bunch of code together, uh, and things like strength reduction, uh, just choosing better instructions. So I'll show you a few of these. Uh, again, I like doing these. Uh, they're fun <laughs> to do, uh, and sometimes uh, manually fun. Right? You want to say exactly what your code looks like, but dead code elimination, again, if you're not aware of this, is just removing unreachable code, variables that you don't use. And most of the time, your IDE, your editors, might be doing this for you, right? They'll help you out and put a little squiggly line and say, uh, well, the assignment to this variable B here is never used. So just get rid of it, right? Why pay any storage? Why do any computation if it's not going to be used? OK. So that's uh, dead code elimination. Uh, we have other things like common sub-expression elimination, which in this example, uh, if I've got this uh, code here, A equals B times C plus G, and D equals B times C times E. Uh, again, if I see what's common here, B times C, and there's no operation interleaved between them, well, I could just compute that one time. Right? And say temp equals B times C, and just uh, pop it in uh, where uh, these expressions A and D are, and I've effectively saved a multiplication. Okay, as well as the lookups for B and C in memory. Uh, so that's a really nice operation or optimization that we can do. And it's uh, certainly very valuable if we start having larger and larger expressions, things like trigonomic functions or maybe just other uh, values that we're, we're returning from a function. Uh, but it does sort of hint at this idea that we'll probably want to look at later, which is caching these values. Okay, so in a sense that what we're doing here is just caching b times c into this temp value. Uh, so that's kind of neat. We can do this sort of hand tuning uh, if we want. All right, uh, so here's um, just another example, uh, again, where these caching uh, can be useful. Um, and again, it can be kind of sneaky in our code. Uh, so the example I have here is, let's say we have some structure here, a graph. Uh, so something less trivial where you might have to compute the size. I know in my example, I just said return 42, but <laughs> I just wanted to give you something you could compile. But again, pretend we have a breadth first or depth first or some interesting traversal you know, along a shortest path or something. Uh, but if I go ahead and look at lines 19 through 21, I'm recomputing the size over and over and over again uh, versus below here. Well, I could probably just cache that size here, okay? Especially if it's not going to be changing uh, throughout the duration of this loop, right? Why compute that over and over and over again, right? So we have these little uh, tricks, um, sometimes in non-obvious places. I know I'm always putting uh, vector.size or whatever everywhere. Um, you know, and we don't necessarily need to, um, I guess a vector is okay, but if it's a non-trivial data structure like a, a graph, we don't need to recompute all the time. And even within this little loop here, so still talking about some of our hand-tuned op optimizations, we get into things like strength reduction. Um, do folks know the difference between plus plus i and i plus plus, prefix versus po postfix? I'm getting a lot of head nods here, right? We'll usually get a different assembly instruction uh, that could do the pre-increment versus post-increment, which is a uh, lookup and then an addition. Uh, now most, um, so, so that's a little uh, optimization you can have. As well as you have little things here like expressing your intent, right? I not equal to the graph size versus I less than the graph size. That's probably what you mean, right? You're trying to traverse the whole thing, so maybe not equals is a better operation than less than. Again, uh, little uh, strength reduction things you could take a look at. Um, so we can you know, continue hand optimizing our code further and further. We're going to revisit this uh, in a moment when I talk about compile time optimization, uh, which is 
uh, to tell you that it's just handy to know some of these optimizations. So one, you don't have to necessarily write your code uh, doing the sub-expression you know, elimination uh, by hand. Uh, right? That was another trade-off that someone mentioned here, readability, uh, super important. Um, so I could go down that road and give the rest of this talk doing little hand tuned optimizations. Um, I'm sure we could come up with a whole list of them uh, with folks in the audience. Uh, but let's take the other road. Let's take the right side here, focusing more on uh, better algorithms and better data structures. Uh, and yes, that is a playoff of Sean Perrin's better code data structures talk. <laughs> For those who haven't seen, watch some Sean Parent talks linked at the end. Um, so, you know, another runtime optimization, just choosing better algorithms and data structures. Um, here's a common example uh, that I see learners when they're you know, first learning the STL, we need some sort of associative data structure, uh, map versus unordered map. Uh, maybe let me just take a hand for this one. Uh, what's the difference between these two data structures? But yeah. Hash versus a tree, yep. So the usual implementations, a map, usually some sort of balanced tree, red black tree uh, would be common, which usually means log base two n operations uh, for insertion, update, delete, unordered map, um, which is not uh, sorted, means we can use a hash table. So usually we're looking at average case O of one operations for insertion, deletion, removal, uh, or update. Um, so again, if you don't need your data sorted, then unordered map can be much more efficient, okay? You, and we don't want to pay for something that we're not going to use. So again, just choosing the right data structure, again, just another uh, example of this. Um, and often can be quite uh, significant. So again, we can continue down this path here. Uh, that's just a nice common example. And again, with the standard template library, oftentimes it's just a drop-in replacement, uh, unordered map versus map for most of the operations. Uh, and most of us are probably going to make a career out of, you know, picking out better data structures, maybe inventing some new ones. <laughs> so I'll just kind of leave it at that to keep inventing and, and adding more there. Um, so let's kind of move on here. Um, and we've turned left where we can do these sort of micro optimizations. We've turned right where we can uh, start doing stuff like choosing better data structures. Again, it's sort of a, a macro level. Um, but the good news is, you know, we have even more strategies than that. And I haven't gotten to the run away from the computation part um, that can make our code more performant. Uh, so we do have this other strategy here, which is just not to make a decision. We don't want to go left or right. We're just going to stand here and stall as long as we can. <laughs> so I'm just going to hold the microphone. And we're just going to wait until we need an answer, essentially. Uh, so let's sort of run away from this problem, uh, figuring out how to you know, optimize our code. So what can we do here with this strategy at runtime? Delaying or stalling? Well, in C++11, um, as well as, you know, the boost libraries prior to this, we have some mechanisms where we can uh, sort of package up computations in different ways. So I'm speaking in particular of promises and futures, which sort of bundle together uh, promise, um, sort of stores a value that's going to later be acquired by the future when it's uh, requested, okay? When we say, hey, give me some uh, computation, okay? Um, so I don't need you to read the, the code here on the right. It's too small, but there's comments about what's going on and about the seven or eight lines uh, there of actual code. Uh, but again, the basic idea is we want to execute, execute, uh, and then block until we need some sort of result, okay? So we'll retrieve some result at a later time when we actually need it. Um, so that's sort of the idea of just stalling, right? We continue our computation, and then we wait for the data when we actually need it. Now, there's actually a little bit of a nicer mechanism uh, for working with promise and future here. So as I show here, we're actually sort of always blocking if we do my future dot wait or dot get here. So let me just get to the uh, mechanism uh, by creating a async function here. And the idea is here that, again, we're just going to defer our computation using async. And again, we're going to pass in a policy here for launch deferred here. And that's just going to perform what's a lazy computation here. So our program will proceed after line 18 here, or have this async that's executing lazily some other computation. And it'll proceed forward and forward and forward and forward as it needs. 
Now, in this particular example that I have here, from lines 24 through 30, you'll notice I created this Boolean flag. I set it equal to false. I evaluate our condition, so this flag is false. And, well, I never call lazy.get, so I never actually execute this uh, function here from lazy, okay? Because uh, we didn't need it. Now, if I flip this to true, then uh, it'll actually you know, perform our result and we'll block here until we get it. Uh, but this is the idea that I didn't need to do some computation or preemptively do it. And there's a variety of ways that you could organize this to perhaps um, you know, just do the computation ahead of time if you need it and then grab the result, right? This can happen in another thread. Or again, we could do this sort of lazy evaluation, just stall, right? I'm running away from the computation literally at this time until the last possible moment, okay? So getting into the theme of our talk. So uh, with that in mind, I kind of like this idea of just stalling, okay? If I'm doing no work, that's sort of the best uh, possible outcome. Uh, I don't have to make any trade-offs because again, we're still paying, uh, even with our time versus space trade-off something, right? I'm either paying more memory or time. Uh, but if I can just stall and not pay anything for as long as possible, that can often be good. Um, so there are more strategies for this. There's many more, uh, but one I want to give here um, that is on occasionally used is called uh, copy on write. Uh, so with this strategy, again, we're going to defer our computation uh, just like our previous uh, strategy, and we're going to wait until we actually need to make use of some new data. Um, so the idea on this, uh, copy on write, which you might have heard as lazy initialization as well, depending on what programming languages you've used. Uh, the idea is if you're making copies of some data structure, like a string, for example, uh, you could implement a copy on write that, uh, well, if I'm making a lot of copies and I'm just reading values from those copies, nothing's actually changed. So I don't need to update anything. I don't need to actually initialize a new string and change a you know, block of memory. I can just keep using the old string, essentially. Okay, so that's the idea of copy on write. Uh, and again, you might have studied this in various, um, if you've taken an architecture class on different caching policies, this might work, right? Different write back uh, policies and so on. Uh, so that's the idea with copy on write. Right? We just defer until we actually update one of the copies, and then we'll do the allocation and say, okay, okay, this actually is a separate string now. Okay, make sense for folks? So copy on write. All right, so summarizing those runtime computation strategies, uh, we've got you know, using a better algorithm, uh, doing less work, uh, hand tuning our code, again, just maybe performing some clever uh, tricks, Again, better algorithms, better data structures. So that's really just one. <laughs> but um, you know, think about it a different way. And then we've got this idea where we can just sort of delay, install our computations, maybe using something like async or a lazy uh, uh, operation, or uh, copy on write, which would be a lazy initialization. Again, deferring, uh, making an actual copy of our object until we absolutely need it. And again, this isn't even really close to a complete list of how many optimizations that we can do with our code. Again, you can think of many different optimizations that we could hand tune and so on. Uh, we can get into GPU stuff. We've got, uh, for those of you who are at Vice's talk, lots of different instruction level parallelism. You get some of that for free, whether you like it or not, uh, through pipelining <laughs> on your machine. Uh, but hopefully, again, that just gives you a model of uh, thinking about some of the different things that we can do uh, for runtime. Uh, and again, if you're a GPU programmer, I hear you screaming. You're saying, run towards the computation. More, right? We pay a lot of money for these machines. <laughs> Use all the cores. Keep your machine 100% utilized. Uh, I know, that's a separate talk <laughs> on that topic, right? With the obligatory uh, Moore's uh, law diagram. Um, but uh, again, that's, uh, we're going to run away from computation here to try to get performance. So let's run the other direction. We've talked about runtime optimizations. Uh, thinking about, again, how to make our code more efficient and run faster, but uh, again, unique to C++ or other compiled languages, what can we do at compile time? Okay, we get to make this choice because, again, there's all that processing that's happening as we're building our source code uh, uh, files. Okay, uh, something must be executing, um, so can we do something and take advantage of that computation if we're going to process all these files anyway? 
Um, so let me just introduce you again to some of the ideas uh, that we can control at compile time. And again, the spoiler alert, some of these ideas are exactly the same that we've seen. So number one, you know, let the compiler optimize. So when you compile your code, you can pass in 02, 03, 01, or you know, a, a bunch of other optimizations, and it can take care of this hard work for dead code elimination. Um, now, you'll probably still want to get rid of that dead code anyways <laughs> in your source code, but um, the compiler has a full view of your source, so you probably want to take advantage of that. Uh, and likewise, with things like common sub-expression elimination, the compilers can do many of these optimizations and use some heuristics to do this well enough for you. Again, so you don't have to write code that's very, very um, verbose and might be hard to read later. Again, the, the point here is that it's good to know some of these optimizations exist. If you're using Clang or GCC, you can actually run the pass managers and see how your code's transforming to confirm that it's working. Um, but again, it'll help you during your iteration stage of just writing clear code and then running some optimizations. Okay, and of course that's taking place at compile time because you're compiling your code um, and it's running these. Okay, so here's another strategy here. Uh, it has to do with the C++ uh, language and something that might be checked at compile time. Uh, and I've got two functions here, uh, pass by pointer and pass by reference. Uh, and then a, um, ooh, yucky, a global variable here, but you know, just for the purpose of this example. <laughs> Should have marked it at least static, I suppose. But um, for the question here, what do folks think in the audience? Is there gonna be any difference in the assembly code between these two functions? Uh, one's being passed by pointer, one's being passed by reference here. I'll, I'll let you just kind of think, everybody lock in their answers in their head. Uh, is there going to be any difference in the assembly code? Uh, let's see. Well, here's whatever version of um, GCC I was using in Godbolt. Um, same instructions. Uh, so, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, a, a reference has to be, right? It's, it's referring to something else, right? Um, so if I look at the assembly again, uh, if you don't believe me, <laughs> it's the same, same instruction set. I mean, we could probably even re in a sense reuse the um, assembly. Um, but why do I like passing by a reference here? Um, well, you know, this is something again that C++ gives me, right? We have references versus uh, the C language, uh, but there are some things that are enforced, uh, meaning that in this example, this function from line five to eight, passed by pointer, uh, I probably do want to check if this is a null pointer here. Okay, I probably do want to handle some of that error checking. Uh, passed by reference, yeah, maybe I want to check. I mean, you can, it's hard, harder, <laughs> but I could try to make this null. Um, but, you know, I don't have to pay that additional cost of, you know, every function that I pass a pointer and saying if this is, you know, null and then having some error handling code. Um, so that's kind of a nice thing that I can uh, enforce in a way of, of cleaning up my code, okay? Um, so that's a few uh, extra steps of computation I can get uh, rid of uh, if I can get away with uh, passing by reference, okay? And that's the general core guidelines. Again, for those of you who saw Bjarne's uh, keynote, right, looking at these core guidelines, if you click on this, it'll say use re references whenever possible and whenever you can't, you use pointers. <laughs> and those are your, your choices. Um, all right, so uh, that leads me to this question for our audience here. Uh, oh, and I'll take some answers if you folks shout them out, but uh, when's the best time, in your opinion, to catch a bug? At, at compile time. Yeah, I'm making this too easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was that? It's writing it. At writing it. Okay, thinking ahead of uh, even before. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. The, the more... Um, the earlier, the better, right? Uh, we've, all, we've all had bugs. Um, but if we can catch a bug, right, we know for sure uh, at compile time. So generally, before it occurs, and compile time is the first time that we're going to know, ideally. Okay? Uh, so that's optimal for us as a developer. Again, to save us time, debug time, development time, and so on. So we have some tools, again, in C++ we can uh, use here. And you'll notice as the language has been evolving, we start getting more of these uh, functions that can execute at uh, compile time. So we have static assert, for example. 
so static asserts going to check at compile time values that are known. Okay, I'll get to const expert in a moment here. Uh, but in this example that I have here with static uh, assert, you'll notice at line five here, I'm checking is the size of an int 5,091. Well, we know it's not. <laughs> so it's actually going to catch that here uh, immediately for us. Okay. Uh, so again, even better, we catch a second pile time. We don't have to do a bunch of different runs along different code paths or anything. Uh, we just find the bug. It's, it's checked at compile time, right? It's part of the code that, that gets compiled. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Uh, and the user doesn't have to pay the cost either, um, like we might with a regular assertion that's going to be uh, checked every time. Okay. Now, of course, there's a place for each of these tools. Uh, so what I'm saying is when you can get away with a static assert, use a static assert. Okay, so prefer compile time checking to runtime checking. And again, this sort of goes with the references thing um, where you talk about pass by pointer versus pass by reference, that if I can get away with doing my error checking at compile time, well, then I don't have to write a bunch of error handling code or you know, these other sort of exceptional uh, circumstances, right? If I know an integer must be four bytes or however big it is on your architecture, um, I can just check it there and uh, handle it appropriately. All right, so getting into that idea of checking values and things at uh, compile time, const expert is uh, our tool. So a big tool in C++11, this idea that we can mark things um, to try to compile at uh, compile time. Okay, so we are paying something. Again, there's always a trade-off here. As we mark things, const expert or static, you know, that's going to increase our developer compile time. Again, probably worth it um, in many cases. Again, but you have to decide what you're going to pay for. Um, but again, this idea is that things that are marked const expert will try to evaluate and get a result. Um, now, because something is also marked as const expert and must be evaluated, it needs to evaluate at compile time to something. This can also protect us against various undefined behavior um, that can creep into your code. And there's many great talks about undefined behavior uh, that have been at Core CPP and other conferences um, if you want to you know, go into the depths of that. Uh, but that's another just advantage of const expert. So let me show you an example here, uh, sort of the classic uh, factorial uh, example. And this program here, I've got one function here. Uh, factorial or fact, I mark it as const expert, so sort of requesting, you know, please evaluate this at compile time when I'm compiling my code. Uh, and then you'll notice at line 16, I'm doing my static assert to see if the factorial of 5, so 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is indeed 120. Um, and if it's not, um, you know, it'll report an error here, compile time check. Um, so you know, this is in contracts to the left side where I've just, the only thing I've removed is the const expert at line four and uh, the assert is no longer a static assert, but one that'll be runtime checked here. Um, so just again, to show you, you know, how much computation are we getting rid of here? Uh, here's the assembly. Uh, so, you know, on the left side here where we're not using const expert or static assert, you know, there's, there's a, decent amount of assembly, right? There's, you know, a page or so, but a little bit bigger than fits in the slide. Uh, but our program on the right basically is a, our program on the right is basically a no-op. It just, re, it's a program that returns zero <laughs> because the factorial uh, program uh, passes this assertion. And again, that's just all at compile time, uh, which is pretty neat, uh, I must say. Uh, you know, doing these little things here. Uh, so we're saving space <laughs> in our binary uh, and our user uh, time. Okay. All right. So speaking of more sort of compile time stuff, um, now what happens when we have lots of data that we want to load? Because maybe we do want to load a file with a bunch of data, uh, pre-compute some tables. Uh, maybe we've run a machine learning model and need to store a bunch of things. I work in graphics. We want to store a 3D model or something. Uh, so again, we could pay the cost of opening the file, checking if it exists, um, you know, handling all the exceptions, or we can just bake it into the uh, binary, which may or may not be what you want to do. But uh, in this case, uh, let's say we want to do that same factorial example, but uh, from line six to eight here, 
uh, on this example, I'm just going to populate in an array, so creating a table here, the different uh, factorials. Okay? So when I proceed something with static, that's static storage, it's baked into or embedded into our executable. Um, so that's pretty neat because, again, uh, I can do this uh, lookup on the factorial here. Uh, and I omitted the uh, static assert here, that's a little bug here, but I can actually just check, again, at compile time uh, that this value exists. Or, interestingly, if I wanted to compute the factorial of, say, the 11th value, right, the next one here, well, I've already got the first 10 populated, so then I can just take the 10th one times 11 and, again, save computation that way, right? So I've sort of pre-computed or cached, again, that idea that we learned about earlier, uh, some of these previous values and can make use of that, okay? Uh, and on the bottom is the actual assembly, just so you can see the uh, different values that are being stored, again, inside of the executable. Uh, so that's another strategy that we can use, again, so we don't have to, at runtime, pre-compute all these values. And do, you know, we've, we've done the, the caching or uh, memoization of these factorials already. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Uh, and just a little aside, there's other different tools and tricks that you can use. You know, some folks will store a bunch of binary data and header files. Uh, C23, I don't know if folks all has embed, uh, which means I think we'll get some flavor of that in C++, so we could just embed a bunch of binary data, uh, which I think is pretty cool. All right, so getting into other, uh, the, the last uh, example I'll talk about here at compile time, uh, we have other tools that actually do their uh, computation at compile time. So templates is the first one that jumps out. Again, a talk that deserves um, its own full talk here on the different types of uh, metaprogramming that we can do. Uh, but just a small example, uh, again, would be to, uh, if I have some data structure here, like a vector, uh, so the mathematical vector uh, with a length, I might want to specialize versions of it, for instance, and unroll. So again, doing my little hand tune optimizations here, uh, that actual vector here, and maybe I get a little bit of performance out of that, okay? And we can actually take template metaprogramming again quite far. We can do the factorial example just using templates, and we're just doing a little bit more work at um, compile time, or potentially a lot more work. And then we're also trading maybe size of our uh, program versus, again, uh, runtime, okay? So summarizing those strategies, we have the ability to use our compiler, the different optimizations, use a language, which I showed an example of references, use various compile time um, facilities built into language, things like static assert. Uh, there's other things like static cast and so on. We've got const expr uh, to mark general functions. We can utilize static storage if we're going to pre-compute values and store them in uh, tables and take advantage of that uh, for memoization and caching purposes, and then template metaprogramming, whether that means specializing various functions to get performance or actually doing uh, computation. Uh, so with that, wrapping things up here, uh, we've discussed you know, a fundamental trade-off of computer science. And you folks, uh, you know, A++ for everybody, you know, <laughs> time versus space, as well as many other uh, trade-offs that we make as developers. Um, but again, with C++, I just also want us to think about if you're not getting the performance that you might need versus time and uh, space by just thinking about data structures, consider compile time and runtime, and take advantage of that key feature uh, that we have in C++ available to us with the different uh, facilities. Um, so hopefully you're leaving this talk with a few different tricks or maybe just a different way to think about uh, some of the different ways that you can um, do some trade-offs with time versus space. Uh, a few of the talks here that were referenced, um, Sean Parent's talk on structures, API design if you want to learn a lot about copy on write, uh, async for deferring our computation, and there's a bunch of compiler optimizations, which is a great place to start learning about some of these things. Uh, and of course, your homework here, um, you know, try computing factorial in different ways. Just use that example. Try it with templates. Uh, try it the way I did with const expert and runtime, and, and measure the different things. Measure the time the program takes, 
measure the space of the executable, how much source code is generated, uh, and that'll give you some ideas of uh, some different experiments you can do. All right, and with that said, folks, uh, lunch is being served, I think, soon here. Thank you. Thank you.